Hey everyone, and welcome to Geek Scant, the home of RPG goodness and general tomfoolery. My name is Zach, and I'm joined by uh, creator and designer, uh, first-time Kickstarter entrepreneur, Sean Hook. How you doing? Oh, doing good, thanks. So let's start off. Let's start off with a couple of easy questions. Who are you, Sean? What 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 should people <laughs> find fascinating about you? Oh, um. <laughs> I've been a gamer since uh, I was a little kid. I actually got exposed to D&D in like fifth grade. Um, we didn't really play by the rules. We just really enjoyed rolling the dice and creating stories. Um, and what, what, that kind of... <laughs> what did you start with? Like, what, what Do you remember what books you, you procured right out the gate? Uh, um, well, uh, my buddy had the original Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual and the Player's Handbook. Um, I ended up finding a local hobby shop that specialized in like RC cars, but they actually had one shelf that was D&D, and I would go there every week with the money that I got from mowing lawns, and I would pick out a miniature or a module or whatever, and that was just like what I did. Like I was super into it <laughs> when I when I first found out about D&D, and uh, since in my group of friends, I was the person that discovered D&D, you know, because this this was a guy I hung out with in the summers. Um, he introduced me to it, and then I came back to my group of friends, and I was like, okay, there's this really cool game we've all got to play, you know. Uh, that that kind of set me up to be the DM, and I've kind of been a, a forever DM uh, since then. I, I, think, I think I played as a player in maybe four campaigns in the, you know, 30-plus <laughs> years that <laughs> I've been in the hobby, so years you, so you, you 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 you're lucky i guess um, I, a lot of times we come on folks come onto the show and they talk about those first forays and like somebody will have the original player's guide and somebody will have the second edition monster manual and somebody else will have you know like like this mixed bag of things but you're fortunate enough to have that that it, it, it was it was <laughs> Yeah, it was actually his older brother. His older brother had it, and it was kind of like, I think his older brother didn't know we were playing with it because he probably would have been pissed. <laughs> but he even had like like one of the very first uh, miniature boxes, and I remember like it was all of the the old. Um, uh, oh boy, I can't remember. The, it starts with the R. It's, I don't think it was Reaper. It was somebody else uh, back then. But the really really corny looking you know fighters and wizards with this sh super tall cape you know cowl like and everything Ralph else Martha and like, minis and things like that. yeah it was actually real partha thank you i knew yeah, it started yeah. with an r and i couldn't remember but yeah some really horrible sculpts but it was just awesome it was just you know hey we've got these figures we can actually use and you know so yeah no that 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 was a great experience as a kid for sure going to those hobby shops and picking up minis and adventures and things were there any any printed adventures or, or modules that you remember picking up or just supplements in general that you remember picking up and, and leaving a mark on you? Oh, no, I always it was modules is what interested me most for sure. Um, I remember Ghost Tower of Inverness. I, I picked that one up. Um, and then um, uh, In Search of the Unknown. Uh, and then uh, what as I got older, that's when the they started doing the the basic and the expert and the you know um, master rules, and I bought I bought and you know gobbled all those up. Um, and I remember when Immortals came out, I'm like, okay, God, we got to we, we need to create you know gods for us to play or you know um, no yeah se when second edition came out, I was pretty heavy into that. I actually liked the customization options that they had. I remember getting the big D&D binder for all the monsters with the three-hole punch that you'd, you'd put in the binder every time they had an expansion for monsters. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> oh, Really, like, like, that was an ingenious idea. Um, I think, like, the idea of, like, being able to expand your book mm -hmm. easily was really clever, I think, at that point in time. I think that it... it <laughs> My guess is that it really appealed to certain people who wanted, you know, condensed and, and wanted organization. And it probably, oh yeah, I mean, it was it was before my time in the hobby, but it probably also turned away people who like book, you know, who want who want the book. Yeah, but they, the, the, with the second edition, they had produced uh, a ton of new books, so they had the handbooks for every class, and that was really cool to see. So you had all these customization options and whatnot. We, we, I would say it was in high school. We actually kind of rebelled against D and D because we felt D and D was like, well, you know, everybody plays D and D. We got to be the cool kids. Let's find something else. Um, and I, I, I grew up in Michigan, and there's a local company, Palladium Games. Mm -hmm. Um, and they had the Palladium role-playing game, which was a, uh, a, um, 
a kind of a D&D competitor or whatever. It was a fantasy system. And we got really heavy into that for a while. And then we ended up playing through the, all the Palladium titles, the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, Heroes Unlimited, um, and Riffs. Um, I, to this day, I have, a, I have a buddy that I'm still in touch with from high school. And he, anytime he introduces me to anybody new or role-playing comes up, he talks about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles campaign that we ran where it was in the, the local mall, shopping mall got taken over by terrorists and the, you know, their characters had to defend it and they were going to GNC and popping pills is to get health back and like, <laughs> just do it. <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, I always like like there's always that phase, and not, and sometimes it's more than a phase, but that phase where you you drift away from from D and D and you you go explore, and it's always fascinating what people latch onto when they go out. and And my guess is that, well, I mean, you already said it, but like typically what people latch onto is what's readily available, especially mm -hmm. you know if you're talking about twenty or thirty years ago when not everything was readily available. It probably was what's at your shops, what's you know, what can you find local and palladium was local. So once we got once we got cars and could drive, um, we found the local hobby shops. There was there was two at the time. There was one called the store, which was really cool. Um, and they had a lot of stuff. And there was another one called Alcove Hobbies. And what was neat about that one is they just had I don't know, like a whole wall, an aisle of miniatures and just all these different miniatures. And that I've always been drawn to miniatures because it would be like, I'd just look at a miniature and be like, oh, this guy, this guy's a, a perfect villain for the next, you know, the next story arc or whatever. And like, you know, just getting inspiration from miniatures quite often. Um, but uh, actually there was a, a, a we have a, a flea market that I grew up near and there was a shop there that would buy secondhand books. And a lot of the books I ended up getting my hands on later were role-playing books from them. They would, people would be selling their collections as they went off or whatever. I think I have like four full sets of the, of the original D and D, the three piece, you know, yeah. like on my shelf over there, one of them's a first print, but it's in really, really bad shape, you know, but you know, just like I would, I would collect them. And I, I had a, up until recently, I actually had as many of the physical modules and stuff as possible. I would, anytime I saw them for sale, I bought them up. And it's like, I always, you know, I always wanted to have them and I'd always use them as reference. Yep. I don't think I, I don't think I ever ran a module cover to cover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be like, I really like this map, but I like the idea from this one or what, you know, like, like bringing, bringing different things. It's just like, as long as I've got the material to reference, you yeah. know, I, I was happy about it, but so that's that's the beginning stages, and then you talked about being a forever DM for the next thirty years and moving through. Did you move through editions all the way to fifth, or what? Or or did uh, no. deviations, or what happened there? Well, I uh, when I was in college, um, I I did more um, one shots because uh, it was difficult with everybody's schedules. So I, I had a few different game systems. I did Call of Cthulhu one shots. Um, I actually signed up and did uh, at some conventions. I would be a game master at conventions. Um, and, you know, you, you try to find a module or you write your own or do something that's like, okay, well, this is something that'll last four hours and people can have a good time playing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, par uh, paranoia mm -hmm. was one that I, I did a bit in, the, in that time period because that's one that lends itself to that kind of gameplay. Um, uh, but once I got... I mean, I played the World of Darkness with Vampire. Um, uh, I, I I would actually pick up every role playing system that I could get my hands on, in all honesty. Um, and I I would read it. I would read the system, and I'd be like, "Boy, I really like this idea, but I cannot stand the way they did this or whatever." So I would always like kind of beg and steal and borrow from different systems, different ideas that I found, and and just kind of tack them on, you know, and and make it work. Uh, in my early mid twenties, I wrote my own game system and flirted with that for a while. Um, and the group of guys I was kind of play testing it with at the end of it told me, you know what, the game system's okay. We really like the world. We think if you do anything, you should focus on the world. So from that point, it was like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, strip it down and try to make it a, a system agnostic where possible, you know, uh, world and, and build out my you know, the, the basic mechanics or the, the, the things that make the world unique. Um, and for probably the past 15 years or so, that's what I've been doing is just really focusing on the, the different nations and, uh, upgrading my, my tools to, for the maps I'm making and all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, we've played a lot of Pathfinder, uh, first edition. We haven't 
moved over to Pathfinder Second Edition that we're talking about doing that next, um, but also Fifth Edition. So we bounce between Pathfinder First Edition and Fifth Edition depending on which group of guys I'm playing with. So, and so that kind of speaks to now we're in the modern era and you've got a mm -hmm. Kickstarter coming out and um, you 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 you've written it for Fifth Edition and I know behind the scenes you're also working on uh, converting it to Pathfinder. So that kind of speaks to you running for both systems and loving both systems and yeah 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 i i found a fifth edition is very approachable for people new to the hobby pathfinder first edition is very crunchy mm -hmm. um uh that the good the group i play with with pathfinder first edition are uh i am the second youngest guy in the group <laughs> <laughs> so they're all in their 50s or maybe over 60 that i've been playing with and they really like they're old old school D&D guys. So Pathfinder First Edition fits very well for them. But the my my son and my daughter um, both play um, D&D Fifth Edition, and that's what they like. Um, and then I have a younger group of guys that um, I met through my, my day job. Um, uh, and we, we play Fifth Edition with them. And uh, it's it's been, they're, they're younger, you know, um, they're, I would say millennials. So, um, you know, they, they don't, they don't have any of the baggage of assuming what D and D is supposed to be. So mm -hmm. fifth edition works well for them, you know? So, um, but yeah, uh, the, the idea for the current book though, the haunt of Ermintz came out of the campaign I was running, uh, for fifth edition. And it was, uh, a group of characters that were kind of like fantasy X files. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were they were uh, a, a group of uh, paranormal investigators essentially uh, in, in in the world setting. Um, fantastic happenings are unusual, even though it's a fantasy setting. It's it's more greedy, uh, realistic fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, magic creatures and things aren't the norm. They're folk and fairy tales, um, except when they're not. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so this was one where they uh, they. But the idea was okay. Well, this is the latest odd happening. You need to go investigate what's going on, and and uh, they 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 received it really well. So I polished it and I tried it again with uh, my you know my kids and tried it again with a, another local group. And it's like okay, I think I've got something that works. So let let's see you know how this goes. So that kind of you, you talked about designing your own system, uh, you know, years ago, and then you started working mm -hmm. on your setting, and now you've got this adventure. So that to me speaks to someone who's always had an eye or a desire, an inclination to share their creations with a wider audience. Um, instead yes. of being a recent thing, this is something that you've been kind of percolating for a while. I felt what I really want to do is a, a, a game setting, a campaign setting. Um, that's that's ultimately what I wanna want, want to do, but I felt um, as a first time publisher or a new publisher, a new new somebody throwing my hat in the ring for the first time that getting somebody to swallow a campaign setting would be difficult. <laughs> so I'm I was like, okay, well, you know, I've got a module that that uh works well. Um I think it's interesting. It's a fun story. And um it, it it's not um it does it, it's not heavily reliant upon any of the tropes or settings that of, of my world you know it, it'll, it'll fit easily into anybody else's campaign yes it's got some elements in there um but it doesn't have anything that's like this makes zero sense for somebody that hasn't ever played in my setting so i felt like it was a good access point a good entry point to be able to get into it so i do think though even even having said that and i i, I i'm a big fan of things that are easily insertable because like you said with 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 all the modules and stuff that you picked up in the past, it makes it really easy to beg, borrow, and steal to to mm -hmm. weld into your own world when when they're not heavily reliant on a setting. That said, I think that a uh, a world which the paranormal or the bizarre, the fantastical, is a little bit out of the ordinary is a is a fascinating uh, place right now, especially because in in five e terms really every entry point that we have officially right now is very magical, very fantastical, Forgotten Realms, Eberron, Ravnica, like everything is, you know, dialed up to 11 as far as there's a magic item and a magic monster around every corner. Yeah. I think that what you're presenting, and then the idea of paranormal investigators is also really great because I know Haunt 
is a mystery. And mm -hmm. right now we're seeing a, a radical shift over the past several years away from tabletop role-playing games being hardcore tactical games where mm -hmm. math and crunch are important, like you were talking about before with Pathfinder, which, by the way, is what I came into the hobby with and is my first love. Um, and we're seeing the shift into the role-play side of it, right, where, you know, in, you know, player characters don't care so much. Players don't care so much about rolling dice. They care about acting as their characters and interacting with interesting characters in turn. And mysteries mm -hmm. are a great way of doing that because they circumnavigate a lot of dice rolling and they put the onus back on the players to get into it and puzzle solve and you know it's, it's the new era of puzzles for five years I, I think is the mystery and i feel like the millennials and even my kids my kids are they're not millennials. i don't know what they're considered they're 18 18 years old 18 and 19 so you know i i guess technically maybe millennials um but um uh they uh uh, they really like the role play aspect. They they really like to get engaged in the story. It's more about talking about what their character does, not necessarily um, even as much as the die rolls. If you if if you know if you tell them to roll the dice, they're more than willing yeah. to do it. You know, but but they're more about you know the actual agency that their character has and what they can do and what what how they interact with the world. And um, for sure, I, I for a long time most of my game when I would run a game, I would expect to have a one combat encounter per session or something, but I would say over the years that I, the current campaign I'm running, I think we've gone five sessions without a battle. Yeah. You know, where it's all just, uh, they're 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 doing investigation, they're developing their characters, they're finding out about the world around them, they're doing mostly social interactions and investigation, and the guys are, the, the feedback I'm getting at the end of the session is that was great. You know, give us more. You know, we like it. You know, um, and and that the haunt comes from that i mean it's largely a social um adventure and mostly investigation you're trying to find out what's actually going on uh, there's a number of people to talk to there's all kinds of information that you can figure out but you might not figure out the actual you know what <laughs> event that's happening it might be more like oh you stumble across it you know so yeah i try um i learned a long time ago that uh, railroading isn't a great idea um, I might have some set pieces in my head, some things that encounters or, or conversations or, um, you know, an event that needs to happen, but it doesn't matter where it happens. I try not to have it wrapped up in a particular location, you know? Um, so, I, you know, you have to be flexible as the DM. I, I, you never know what they're going to do next. <laughs> you really don't. Well, I'm, I'm thoroughly enthused about it. I, I know we talked before we before we hit the record button um, about like I think mysteries are mysteries in general I think are, are the 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 ideal content right now um, for for especially for 5e and there's just so many reasons for it. So I think I think Haunt has a, a great chance of being a really ideal product for a lot of tables. Um, especially like if you're a low level table um, and and low level party and you want <clears throat> you want something outside the norm. I know sometimes people want a dungeon crawl even still or something like that, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I'm a I'm a big fan right now of content that's digestible and things that aren't going to take 25 sessions, 52 sessions in order to complete. And yeah, so, yeah. This I might it, it, it this this one in my experience my playthrough it takes a couple. Yeah. But it all depends. It all depends on the party. Um, it depends on where they go. If they decide to go tromping off in the forest, uh, instead of talking to the people in town, then you've got to accommodate that. You know, yeah. so uh, it it can play out a couple different ways. But uh, I think most of the situations in there. I mean, uh, I have a couple encounters set up, but really, one could be potentially avoided altogether, um, and the other, yeah, I guess you could run away. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, Haunt of Erminsk is going to be on Kickstarter. We're going to launch it uh, first part of May, um, so keep your eye out for that. Um, Sean, you've been good enough to, to work with us to let us help you on the back end with fulfillment and things like that. We're excited about that. 5e is always a, a, a cool product to add to our shelves. I've done a ton of that. Of course, it's awesome. Um, and then from there, I think the idea is that uh, Athelu can just go wherever, you know, wherever – 
you've got in your head at that point. This is kind of the first entry point, but mm -hmm. it won't be the last, I think, is the objective here. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, uh, I've, I've been writing still. Um, I, I have another module that I've been uh, tweaking, but uh, I have, a, a, like I said, a main campaign setting that I've been working on for a while now that I would, I would really like to have see the light of day. Um, yeah. But I, I, I'm hoping there's an audience. So. For sure. Well, okay. So um, keep an eye on that. We'll post links down in the show notes for for where you can go and follow the Kickstarter already to get notified when it goes live. This is going to be a digital product and a soft cover book. Um, mm -hmm. Sean has already done all the heavy lifting, and the book is, I mean, it's the PDF is done, right? Like you've already ordered a uh, like a proof copy to yep. for prints and all that. So like. As a first-time creator, you've done all the legwork to make sure that you're actually going to be delivering um, what you say you're going to deliver. And, I mean, I've seen it. It's it's awesome. So um, I think this is a win for everybody. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Sean. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's, it's nice to be able to talk about this stuff. There you go. All right. Well, good luck to you, Sean, and we'll uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks.